Good evening. This is Mae Brussels in Carmel, California. It's tape number 437, April the 11th, 1980, side one of the tape. I'm going to try to eliminate the music. I don't know whether it's a hindrance, whether it helps or interferes. I only use it as a lead for the beginning and end to make sure that none of the tape was cut off. I'll allow the same amount of time at each end, but for a few weeks I'll try this and see if we can uh, do without the music. It does take a lot of extra time and uh, see how we go with just straight news and no music. There's a local group here that has various people uh, lecturing or speaking with them once a week on current subjects, and they invited me to speak next week on a topic that I thought was of importance to the news. I could choose any subject I wanted. And the title of the speech that I'm going to share with them, the information, is uh, this. Is America a captured nation? Now, uh, a lot of you who have taken the tapes for a long time know how I feel about the United States of America. In essence, I believe that as soon as World War II was over, certain persons in our State Department, like John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, the Rockefellers, the multinational corporations, ITT, and many of the large industries of the United States were very sorry that the Soviet Union had been our ally. We had pumped Adolf Hitler up as our bulwark against communism to fight the Soviet Union, and he lost that battle in 1943, and at that time the decision was made to entrench the top aides of Adolf Hitler and that team into the American intelligence apparatus and when war was formally over by 1945, the Nazis, headed under Reinhard Galen, the chief of Hitler's Eastern Division and Intelligence, began to form our National Security Council and our Central Intelligence Agency. And since that time, everything that has been done in the United States, every major decision and policy has been to the detriment of the United States and has made Japan, Germany, the Netherlands stronger nations, even Great Britain and France and the United States has become weaker all the time. We've become the bullies, the assassins, until we're at the point where we're morally, psychologically, economically, and politically totally bankrupt. And furthermore, I don't know if we can afford any more continuous assassinations because of the payoffs, the extortion, the blackmail that I'll get into later. But this country is a disgrace. People all over the world know what we have done and watch us. And we're divided in so many sections, and that was part of Hitler's plan uh, to take America, was to divide us up into many segments and have the segments fight each other. In a book called Black Male, M-A-I-L, by Henry Hoke, an excellent book published in 1944, he has a quotation of Adolf Hitler that was distributed around the United States in 1940, and this was what Adolf Hitler wrote. He said, in quotes, America is permanently on the brink of revolution. It will be a simple matter for me to produce unrest and revolts in the USA. These gentry will have their hands full with their own affairs. National socialism alone is destined to liberate the American people from the ruling clique. I shall undertake the task simultaneously with the restoration of Germany to her leading position in America. And he goes on to separate the segments, the office holders versus the taxpayers, the native-born versus the foreign-born, the rich against the poor, labor versus management, the young against the old, the colored against the white, Gentiles against Jews, the north against the south, the easterners against the west, the Democrats against the Republicans, conservatives against the liberals, and the Protestants against the Catholics. And when you take these battle lines and you put them into manila files and folders and you watch these elements fight each other, and even the researchers just on the Kennedy assassination, those that disguised as researchers who are spies and those who are honest researchers are pitting the two honest researchers against each other or even the spies against each other. Adolf Hitler knew that there were all these elements in this country that were clawing each other uh, from the time this country began and he doesn't even go into the Indians that were put down or the Chicanos and the Mexican-Americans and the COINTEL programs and the criminal conspiracy sections of the police department. They followed. Those were the work of Adolf Hitler. But he listed the groups that could be separated, that are interlocking segments that could be separated in order 
for Germany to be powerful and take the United States of America. Uh, and in my speaking about are we cap a captured nation, I will refer briefly to books like Sabotage. Uh, I've had that on the tapes for you, The Great Conspiracy, The Nazis Go Underground, The Plot Against the Peace, School for Spies, The Nazi Octopus in South America, The Mufti and the Fuhrer, Armies of Spies, and I've now collected six or 700 books just on this subject on how we got into the quagmire we're in today. Before I get on to abscam and conspiracies, though, I just want to uh, give a few quotations. One, an example of the uh, terrible position Americans in, because I could take 40 headlines from this week and go over them with you, but just one tells the story, really. But there's a, a book review that, I, that sums up Henry Kissinger, a brief book review, came out in the Los Angeles Times in November of 1979 on Henry Kissinger's book, The White House Years. And the book review is by George McGovern. And I want to just share a couple of sentences of that review because I don't think people really catch on. They think that Kissinger's errors were honest errors that blundered or uh, the Congress fortunately stopped him. They don't realize that the one step after kissing or the Nazi running National Security Council and State Department comes in Brzezinski, another Polish Nazi who gets one step further and actually involves us with troops in the Middle East at this time. McGovern said, for 10 years I've been appalled by Mr. Kissinger's views on the horrible tragedy his policies helped to perpetuate in Indochina. The elaborate rationalization of this incredible nightmare that Kissinger lays out in his memoirs only widens the gap between my personal affection for him and my dismay over his part in the still unfolding Holocaust of Indochina. And then George McGovern said, as for his worldview, Mr. Henry Kissinger is, uh, would believe unwittingly sentenced, he would sentence the United States to a slow decline in influence and leadership. He places our power in, the, uh, in opposition to the revolutionary forces that have been convulsing and developing the world since 1945. He pitted us against every government that was trying to affect some kind of change and by not being able to change in the other way, they have become revolutionary. McGovern said, in Kissinger's view, America's greatness would survive only if we had the will to play an imperial role in global affairs. He would have used whatever military power was required to smash Indochina to its knees, nor do I doubt that he would have used American might to order events in Africa to his own liking. He would use the muscle of the United States to deploy and save the Shah of Iran, which was already a fait accompli. The people didn't want him, and he would have sent troops in for Samosa and Nicaragua. There are many other Americans who yearn to see Uncle Sam boldly assume that role of policeman for the world. I see that role as an obsolete fantasy that, if employed, would spell frustration, defeat, and eventually exhaustion for the United States. Now, I say we're morally, financially, politically bankrupt, and the kissinger brzezinski policy has brought us to the edge of frustration, defeat, exhaustion, and there won't be anything left of this country, guided by the Polish and the German Nazis running the National Security Council and the State Department. The article I'm referring to that is the epitome of the stupidity we can get into without any brains about how to get out of these problems was one of the New York Times this week. The Navy is feeling the strain in Indian Ocean. That's the title of the article. Imagine the United States Navy is feeling the strain and they haven't even gone to war yet. There are two aircraft carriers, 16 other warships, eight supply vessels, and an 1,800-man marine amphibious force sitting in the Indian Ocean. Jimmy Carter escalated that when the hostages were taken in Iran and the Soviet Union went into Afghanistan. And now the head of the Defense Department, Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, and Admiral Thomas Hayward, Chief of Navy Operations, are saying that the Navy faces severe difficulties if the fleet is uh, kept in the Indian Ocean, that the Mediterranean is weak, the Pacific Ocean is weak, the morale of the crewmen is terrible. Some have been there more than 100 days, and they say staying in the Indian Ocean will exacerbate the services already that has serious problem retaining skilled crewmen. They're having difficulties keeping them going. 
The sheer cost of the support system there is terrible. It's cost $1 billion so far. Uh, they can't afford to finance this. The fuel is expensive. And the mission has, in quotes, stretched its capabilities. It stretched the uh, American Navy. Now, when we had war in Southeast Asia, it was hard on the Americans to go there, uh, to go into the jungles. But even in that ghastly war, when they were flown over, there was a native population. There were women, uh, joined sex, beer, uh, saloons, and some simulation of the things that they needed or were used to at home. They're over in a territory where they're not prepared. They were trained at places like the Mojave Desert, and after training, they could go into Barstow and get their recreation and cool off and uh, have a smoke and see people that they knew. Now they're in a, a territory where the women are veiled, where there's no middle class, where slave labor is kept in concentration camp areas in Saudi Arabia, brought in from uh, South and North Cor South Korea, not North Korea, where uh, if they land, there's no drinks, there's no women, there's severe punishments if they're caught with any of these activities. They are kept hostages on boats outside a place which is costing a fortune and which can't possibly bomb oil fields and survive, and all of our fleet, or a good hunk of it, are sitting there like Pearl Harbor, almost like uh, waiting for a kamikaze to blow them up, and uh, they're impotent. They can't move one way or the other, which is what I said would happen last November when the men were taken hostages. I called it to reach the apex of American power, and from there we decline. But the situation there with, with these men as I say, there's no wine, there's no women, it's hot, it's going into summer, we don't have enough ships elsewhere, they're running out of fuel, uh, the cost is tremendous, we can't afford to fight and we can't afford to keep them there, and besides that, the men psychologically are going bananas. That is just one sample of the kind of problem that you are probably reading and I'm reading, but which is so typical of the blundering of people like Jimmy Carter who are living back their mind way, way back at a time where they could send ships out and think it would scare somebody. Nobody is scared by the American fleet, and the actual people there will not be able to function normally, even in a time of battle, probably. It goes on to say because they're beginning to malfunction psychologically and emotionally from the isolation of sitting in a hot place like that on a ship and not going anywhere. The subject of the Nazification of America is interesting and uh, uh, there's a new book out by Charles Hyman called Errol Flynn, The Untold Story, and it's the story of Errol Flynn, the movie star, working for the Gestapo, a traitor to the United States government. And Mr. Hyman has been um, doing interviews, radio talk shows about this book, and he was on KGO Radio in San Francisco, and Owen Spann was the moderator. And I called up to make the point that the Errol Flynn the actor is long gone, but the people that worked with Errol Flynn in the Bahamas and the Matego Bay, Monte Carlo, London, Mexico are still alive and are part of the Nazi network that were involved in the killing of John Kennedy, and they were involved in the Watergate operations and are in power today. At that point, Owen Spann, the moderator, this is ABC own station out here, hung up immediately and uh, said to Mr. Hyman on the air, oh, these crazies always call and bring in these assassinations. So I called Charles Hyman. I took a chance at where he was staying and called him and spoke to him and shared some information about uh, Errol Flynn and the linking of the Nazis. But the important point I wanted to make about my conversation with him was his surprise at the reaction to his promoting this book. He, his father is a member of, was a member of parliament in Great Britain. He's an American citizen now. And he remembered the bombings in London during the war. And he can't imagine why, when you say somebody is a Nazi and a traitor to um, the free world or democracy, why uh, people are turning against him and angry. The Hearst paper put down his book. And, of course, I explained the role of Randolph Hearst, uh, putting Hitler into power and supporting the Nazi regime and all the fascist organizations after that. And uh, the media has been trying to put him down, and talk show people are antagonistic to him. And what I said was, rearrange your head, Mr. Hyman, about the way the world is today. This is a captured nation. 
and the Nazis won. And you are speaking out there to an audience as if you were in Poland in 1939, in, say, September the 1st, before the Nazis invaded. And you're saying the Germans are coming, the Nazis are coming. They would resent you because they don't like the communists. And in 24 hours after Adolf Hitler invaded Poland, the network was set for Poland to collapse. Or put yourself in France in 1940 talking about Adolf Hitler and talking about the Nazis when all the press and all the government were pro-Adolf Hitler and had secretly made deals so that when Hitler came into France within 24 hours, it would fall. And what I explained is that we are a captive nation and you're trying to appeal to logic or reason, whereas people today want to go to war against Russia. They want that Third World War. And Hitler will come out the hero of the 20, 30, and 40s and 50s because he warned us about Russia and we waited too long to go in to get Russia to get him. Never a word about peace or the alternatives, the way we could run the world with peace. The main thing is to keep the war machine going in every sense of the word. Uh, Mr. Hyman and I shared some beliefs about Simon Weisenthal. I never understood why Weisenthal only settled for the Jew uh, Eichmann to be caught in South America, never going after Mengele's Bormann or 20 or 30,000 other Nazis around the world. And Mr. Hyman shared a story about being in Germany and wanting to speak to a party uh, who was involved with Errol Flynn and the Gestapo. I believe uh, that was the relationship. And uh, Mr. Weisenthal said that this person was out of town and wasn't there. And the next day, Charles Hyman was able to get in touch with him. He was, in fact, there. I don't trust the whole so-called Holocaust machine. They emphasize the past, they don't look at the present, and they turn their back on to many of the things that those Nazis in Germany are doing today. Not new Nazis, but the old Nazis. But the book sounds very interesting, and Mr. Hyman's done a lot of work, and I think the links, uh, the Monte Carlo connections, the Bahama connections to Ian Fleming, and a lot of the people that I've mentioned on my past tapes you'll find running through this book. I haven't gotten it yet. I've just seen some very good reviews or interesting reviews of it, but I think it'll be important to read and connect to some of the other characters that have subverted this country systematically and purposely in the favor of Nazi Germany. There is one paperback book out about Errol Flynn, The Two Lies of Errol Flynn by Michael Friedland. And uh, after hearing Mr. Hyman and talking to him, I got an interest in Errol Flynn. I never really cared much about him before this came out. And I started to read this book just to read a little bit of it. And it tells him uh, about him living in New Guinea and uh, working with British soldiers. And uh, I guess that's where he got his first introduction in New Guinea to a doctor who was to get him into the Nazi and Gestapo war machine. It tells about his murdering a person, murdering a whole group of people, uh, savage activities that he did in New Guinea before he ever got to Hollywood and uh, some of his brutality on Austra farm in Australia and so forth. As far as I got in the book, he's really a beast, and this man is uh, trying to write a nice biography about a Hollywood movie star. It's interesting because in that book, he hasn't done any of the work of Errol Flynn to the Gestapo or the war machine, but very early in the book, he describes uh, Flynn's life in New Guinea and he says exactly what he did thereafter will never be known for certain. The only available evidence is confused. Flynn himself spent the rest of his life talking about New Guinea and, Guinea and his exploits there, but the trouble is the, he told a different story every time, and it tells, as I say, about his work with Australian and American troops in New Guinea and uh, then his coming to the United States to make films. It leaves out the... Nazi connections that come later, but there are a lot of loopholes in Flynn's life, and the author is honest to admit that they're there. <laughs> Last week, I did a tape on Irv Davidson. If you don't have that tape, you'll have to get tape 436. I don't want to repeat and waste time on it, uh, but uh, it's an important tape, and this man, Irv Davidson, is a public relations man in Washington, D.C., who is sort of the octopus, the head of the wheel of an eight- Prong conspiracy monster uh, linked to the Kennedy assassination, and one of his prongs is Carlos Marcello of organized crime down in New Orleans, who links to David Ferry, Jack Ruby, Clay Shaw, and Clay Shaw links to 
Reinhardt, Galen, and the Nazi, the Nazi agents and the Solidaris, the, what's known as the Vasilov Army, the White Russians, and so forth. And uh, Davidson is a very important man. Uh, his name came out in the Washington Post April the 2nd, 1980, with a large article. There were smaller ones at the time of the Abscam uh, leaks. The story broke. There are no arrests except for two men in immigration departments so far. But this is an important man, Mr. Davidson, and he's important because Carlos Marcello mentioned in this article in the Washington Post that I had last week was the link of Abscam, the northern uh, organized crime, CIA connections of New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., South Carolina, and Miami to the Bry Lab, the bribery labor linking um, the Southwest, Beverly Hills, Nevada, New Mexico, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, and the, uh, New Orleans. The common denominator between Bry Lab and Abscam, as I mentioned last week, was Carlos Marcello, Marcello of Organized Crime. And what I said uh, was that those researchers who feel gloomy about the Kennedy assassination don't have to worry because the story would be breaking eventually. Truth is on our side. If time isn't on our side, truth is there. So stay healthy and let's get the story out in the open. But just after I made my tape last week, there was an article that should do the researchers' hearts good, put out by Jack Anderson. Um, it was in our Monterey Herald. The San Francisco Chronicle deleted this part of the Jack Anderson article, and I'm going to read it to you all four sentences because I've been researching the Kennedy assassination since November 22, 1963. Mark your calendar, April the 2nd, 1980, the beginning of the breakthrough of the Kennedy assassination. I mentioned Jack Anderson last week because he rented property and office space from this Irv Davidson who was so important. Jack Anderson also has worked with Frank Sturgis and many people uh, involved in the Kennedy assassination and in Watergate story. That was Frank Fiorini in Miami during the days when Jack Kennedy was killed and Frank Sturgis was allegedly um, at Daly Plaza the time that Kennedy was killed. His role has never been defined. But... Jack Anderson had an article, and this is what it said in black letters, and maybe I'll copy it for you and put it on the sheets this week. It's so important. Kennedy Probe. While it is Abscam and Bry Lab scandals that have been making headlines, the FBI is quietly digging into another explosive assignment, the assassination of John Kennedy. The House Assassination Committee turned over to the Bureau its findings that Kennedy was probably killed as a result of a conspiracy, contrary to the conclusion of the Warren Commission 16 years ago. FBI agents have been talking to former committee aides seeking guidance for the use of the committee files in the National Archives. Agents have asked the authors of some of the committee studies for the location of documents cited in footnotes. Now, I'm not talking about the Justice Department going into the a uh, tape of the firing of that fourth bullet, that headshot that killed John Kennedy. Jack Anderson said the Bureau has consulted the CIA on retesting the controversial acoustical evidence of a fourth shot that was fired at Kennedy that day in Dallas. Now, Jack Anderson, in his usual style, would say that the FBI is quietly digging into another blind alley of the Kennedy assassination, or he would paraphrase it, after two expensive investigations, the, the Warren Commission and the House Select Committee, the FBI is lost in a tunnel on the Kennedy. No, he said they're in an explosive assignment, the assassination of John Kennedy. And he uses it while the Abscam and Bry Lab scandals are going and making the headlines, the FBI is going there. Now, as the government began to investigate um, counterfeit money, forgeries, stolen art, uh, bank robberies, uh, blackmailing, extortion, prostitution, pornography, security exchange payments, payoffs, uh, all kinds of wheeling and dealing and skimming. Eventually, eventually it leads them right to the Kennedy assassination. When the CIA was formed after World War II and before the CIA, the OSS, uh, was in operation during World War II, the end of World War II in Italy, 
Lucky Luciano was incorporated into the intelligence community, then brought home to uh, the men to watch the docks in New York City and elsewhere in Marseille. And this strange marriage of CIA to Nazis and CIA to organized crime uh, eventually has to break open, and it's breaking everywhere at the seams. Those gloomy researchers can be very happy now because it will, the story will come out uh, in pieces and pieces. And no matter how hard we researchers work, it's not going to come down the way you think it is. It's going to come down by somebody like Mr. Irv Davidson being wiretapped for a year and working with Carlos Marcellus and so forth. It's going to come down from some informer or person who's telling them things. You know, only 200 people were killed. They were primary witnesses to the Kennedy assassination. But there are two to 300 more who have very important pieces of the information that would bring this country to its knees. And when Jack Anderson begins to say that there's an explosive investigation going on, it's a trial balloon. It's out there, and that means get ready. It's going to become bigger. It's like his taking the IDT memo of Dita Baird that broke open the whole Watergate story months later. You can be sure that this story will eventually unfold if Jack Anderson is talking about the FBI investigation and its possible links to Bra Lab and Abscam. Because the minute those men were arrested at the Watergate Hotel in June 17, 1972, I said it goes back to the Kennedy assassination. And as soon as there were the leaks in the New York Times and Newsday about Abscam and Carlos Marcel, I said, okay, this goes to Watergate, the John Kennedy assassination, and then as the other investigations came, I knew it would all fit together. So there's a very thunderous silence in the news media about my porn, Bry Lab, Abscam, and the other investigations, because so many people are in the pay of organized crime. But there are many people who aren't going to want to go to jail, and in return for immunity, they're going to talk. There was a time when I was able to file the articles I want and get my hands on them. With these new investigations coming, the articles on organized crime, mobsters, drug arrests, and uh, uh, current trials are getting into the news and are very, very important, and there's no way that I'm going to be able to keep you up on all the details. I have one pile of articles here called Crime Articles, Trials, Arrests, to separate and to put in separate files, and I must have at least 100 articles from the news that's come to me this past week from what I take and what other people send. I have a packet here of death unrelated to Abscam, but not certain yet what their connection or importance uh, is. Murders, the president of Liberia, the almost killing of Mrs. Gandhi, uh, deaths from all over, freeway deaths, multiple deaths, strangler in Los Angeles, 35th boy found by the freeway, uh, very important information, and people dying. Um, it's sitting here, a pile of it. Then there is a third pile of abscam-related deaths, organized crime figures being knocked off. It would take a computer and an army to file what I've just cut from this week and share with you the significance. There's no way I can do it. I'm frustrated. I'll make sense and give you the best I can each week, but uh, in time it'll fit together if I ever had a staff or a group of people that could separate these. I've separated my articles of um, the various crime figures, the crime families by name, the current arrest that I have in files, the chronological order of the Abscam murders to put in separate files. I'll do the best I can, but there are many, many people being murdered now, many arrests, and if you take any, say, one-tenth of what are Abscam murders or one-tenth of the deaths that are related to purposeful murders, out of that are going to become people who are going to talk and tell us more of the puzzle. There's just too many people going in the clink that are going to squeal for immunity. And we're going to see a lot of news break about the domestic corruption in the next year, more even than Watergate, because Carter is up to his neck in the narcotic uh, combination, and these people linked to Jimmy Carter and the Georgia connection to the narcotics. And so does Ronald Reagan's team, Paul LaSalle, who manages his team, is from Nevada, uh, he represented uh, the Hughes, the Summa Corporation, the Howard Hughes, which is organized at Resorts International and the originally the Mary Carter Paint Company and organized crime and justice department. So 
Both candidates have strong links to organized crime, to assassination teams, to narcotics traffic, and eventually they'll all be caught in the web. Even Frank Sinatra's name was in the news this week for skimming money. He's part of the Reagan campaign. Neither of the candidates is clean in terms of narcotics, drugs, payoff, and narcotics traffic. Now, we're going to go to the other side of this tape without the music. Uh, you're used to the music. But uh, we'll just switch to the other side, and I'll begin part two of this tape. It's Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. This is side two of tape 437. It's April the 11th, 1980, and this is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. I do want to update a few items with you uh, in the news we don't want to lose track of. I mentioned on other tapes the dilemma of the Shah of Iran, a very important man in regards to American foreign policy. And there was an important article that you might have missed that was in the Washington Post just recently, April the 3rd. 1980, because I said that uh, the Shah was taken from Iran to Egypt and Morocco, the Bahamas, and uh, then to Mexico and New York, Ashland Air Force Base in Panama, that he was under house arrest because so much of his investments are in uh, some very important banks in New York City, particularly the Chase Manhattan Bank in the interests of the Rockefellers, and that the Shah has to be under house arrest because uh, he blames Jimmy Carter and uh, the powers that be in Washington for not protecting his peacock throne and he could retaliate if he wanted and write a check and pull his money out of these banks and bankrupt them very nicely put it in money overseas and one reason he went to Panama uh, was hopefully to invest in Panama but the representatives of David Rockefeller have been very close to the Shah, Mr. Armeo and others to see that he, I'm sure, cannot write a check and pull the money or the rug out from under our banks in New York City. And to support that was an article in the Washington Post, uh, Shah's aid hits the U.S. attitude. And it tells how angry he was. Uh, this is from Cairo when he got there. He said, in my 37 years, I did everything in my power to help and assist my allies. And then it tells the problem they had at the Panamanian hospital and the confrontations with the doctors and uh, uh, the representatives from um, up north, Mr. Armeo and Mr. Jordan from the White House, tried to keep the Shah from leaving Panama and having the surgery there. The, the, the New York Times article said these arguments followed a series of earlier disputes. Oh, I'm sorry, this is from the Washington Post. Between the Shah staff, particularly Armeo, that's the representative of David Rockefeller and Chase Manhattan and Panamanian officials assigned to guard the monarch in his refuge on Contadora Island. Armeo said the Panamanians resented the efforts to bring costs under control and the Shah stay was running up to a six-figure price tag every month. And he believed that uh, they were blocking the access to the Shah's wealth for investment in Panama. There was a big argument because the possibility that the Shah would invest in Panama, and that would mean pulling his money out from the United States. And uh, there was a confrontation there. The article said, once the Shah decided to accept Sadat's offer to go to Cairo, Armeo said the pressure game started. When the U.S. and Panamanian governments, governments were informed that the Shah was going to leave Panama, uh, the ambassador, Moss, and Torrios moved quickly to try to reverse the situation. See, the Shah was under the arrest in Hans Arturios in Panama. U.S. officials urged Abaki to accept their assessment that the operation could be carried out in Panama. They didn't bend. He added Abaki and the others on the Shah's medical team. The Shah didn't want them to bend. This week, the Shah came out and said that he was afraid if he was under the anesthetic, they were going to return him to Iran. And uh, this tells the conflict of the staff that uh, we're fighting to keep the Shah in Panama and not let him get to Egypt. Uh, the White House entered into the negotiations with the Shah's New York lawyer, William Jackson, a partner in the prominent firm of Milbank, Tweed, Hadley, and McCloy. Of course, John J. McCloy has been a part of this uh, scene of the overthrow of Mossadegh and helping the Shah get in and the oil profits with Chase Manhattan. 
He was chairman of the Bank of Chase Manhattan. He was also a lawyer on the Warren Commission, the commission to investigate the assassination of John Kennedy, representing David Rockefeller and the people that were instrumental in having Kennedy killed. Uh, the Washington Post said on the evening of March the 20th, Hamilton Jordan, an acquaintance of Torrijos, arrived in Panama to handle the discussion in person. In the end of the week, he was met by the attorney for the President of the United States, Lloyd Cutler, but the Shah insisted on going on Cairo to Cairo. So there's this tremendous pressure to control the Shah and not get him out of their hands. And as soon as the Shah was in Cairo, Sadat came flying to the United States to the Rose Garden, and I'm sure that he will be paid heavily with weapons and ammunition for Egypt if he keeps the Shah from writing any checks until he dies from his cancer. I'm not defending the Shah any more than I do Martha Mitchell uh, at the time of Watergate, but when you see how they play and kill and manipulate their friends, the power structure, you realize that they'd have very little mercy for us. And they have very little mercy for us. Speaking of Jack Anderson, he had an article that you might have missed. Some of you don't get his uh, articles. It's a shame. You could go to the library and look up the papers that have them. We get one daily. In article April the 4th, last week, 1980, the Drug Enforcement Agency death plot tie alleged. I mentioned on other tapes and radios that the reason um, the Shah was safe in Panama with an old drug dealer like Torrios is the United States had control over him and literally owned him, and uh, at one time they planned to assassinate him. This was cut short at the time of Watergate, and the assassination teams were being exposed. Jack Anderson wrote just last week, General Omar Torrijos, now in the center of a controversy involving the Shah of Iran, was the intended victim of an assassination plot in 1973. In December 77, I reported the rumors that the Watergate plotters that was G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt and Mr. Lucian Conin and so forth, had marked Torrijos for assassination. Now a long-buried Justice Department document is coming out from the Drug Enforcement Agency involving the alleged Watergate plot to assassinate Torrijos. The report was submitted by Michael DeFeo, head of the Justice Department team in 1975, investigating fraud irregularities of contact conduct in the Drug Enforcement Agency at the time that Richard Nixon was in the Drug Agency. The DeFeo report is a confidential briefing of the narcotics connections and the links of the CIA to Drug Enforcement Agencies. And they, as Jack Anderson said last week, they had a plan to kill Torrijos. The DeFeo report goes into assassinations concerning killing Mr. Noriega, Nor, N-O-R-Y-A-G-O, Noriego the principal assistant to the president of Panama, Trujillo's, and that Smith and William Durkin actually proposed these men from the Drug Enforcement Agency that he be killed. What's interesting, Jack Anderson said, is the Drug Enforcement Agency did not figure in the assassination stories at the time. It was a repository for the CIA alumni, particularly Lucian Conin, a colorful ex-CIA operative who had the time of the White House in 1972 was put from the CIA assassination teams into the Drug Enforcement Special Operation. He promptly recruited in the Drug Enforcement Agency 14 CIA colleagues for his 19-member undercover team. Now, Jack Anderson, I'll finish the article with him and then go into some points of the article The article he's written. He said the reference to the assassination plans to kill Torrijo and so forth in the DeFeo report, have 20 allegations of misconduct of Drug Enforcement Agency, including a covert intelligence project in the Caribbean, the use of non-conventional investigative techniques in Panama, improper involvement and gambling interest in Las Vegas, and a questionable relationship between the Drug Enforcement personnel and Intertel, a private security force. Intertel is the uh, Howard Hughes Summa Corporation um, narcotic link that I mentioned before that is linked to Paul Lexall and Ronald Reagan and the Justice Department and the gambling casinos in the Bahamas and up to the Av scam and the Bri Lab up to New Jersey and Las Vegas. Now, uh, Jack Anderson is writing about the drug enforcement agents that were never disciplined, 
Conine from the CIA is higher in the drug enforcement hierarchy than ever. This is April 1980. He's in charge of their strategic intelligence. Mr. Smith, as part of this assassination dream from the Drug Enforcement Agency, left Drug Enforcement Agency to work for Intertel and is now setting up their surveillance system for the Great Bay Casino in Atlantic City. You see how important these things will tie together the assassination teams, Atlantic City, New Jersey, organized crime. Another drug enforcement agent spook was not so fortunate. Santo Barrio was involved in drug enforcement Operation Croupier to penetrate gambling interests, Jack Anderson said, and he recently died under disputed circumstances. I didn't catch the article of Santos Barrio in the paper, but I have some very good listeners uh, who take the tapes, and if you find the death of Santo Barrio from Drug Enforcement Agency, even Jack Anderson in April, April 4th of 1980, is talking about a death of somebody mysteriously. Now, he's talking about this, this document, Drug Enforcement Agency and Organized Crime. I have a full set of that report. It was sent to me by the Scientology Church. It's the report June 18, 1975, to the Attorney General, Michael DeFeo, and two other agents. And on page 9 of this report, they refer to the source of their weapons, the B.R. Fox Laboratories, Conin, working for drug enforcement agencies, purchased weapons for the Fox Laboratories from Alexander, Virginia. And, of course, those are the laboratories of Mitchell Werbel and the Central Intelligence Agency that have supplied weapons and silencers to Conine, the assassination teams of the CIA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and those men that were arrested, the arms merchants of the world that were arrested in December of 1979 this year, Frank Turple and George Karkala, who linked to England and Monte Carlo to the world supplier of weapons. This talks about Conine and where they got their weapons. I could uh, sometime do a whole tape on 40 pages of the drug enforcement article. There's an article about this uh, same operation of planning to kill Torrijos in the San Diego Union, May 23, 1978, San Diego newspaper about the assassination teams, the operations, and a John Ingersoll, who was head of Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous J Drugs in 1972, who was trying to immobilize Panama, who was taking over um, the operations in Panama, and this has to do with the plans to kill Torrijo. That came out in 1978. Jack Anderson's article came out in 1980. The report from DeFeo was in 1975, but May Brussel in 1973, in the Realist article, the summer of 73, I wrote my second published article. The first was in 1972, why was Martha Mitchell kidnapped for the realist? And if you don't have this other article, you should send for them. They're a dollar plus the postage while they remain. My second published article for Paul Krasner was uh, the Senate Select Committee is part of the cover-up. That's the one of the picture of Truman Capote on the cover, cover in a fish pole. And in that article, I talked about the illegal criminal spy operations of the Central Intelligence Agency that were linked Richard Nixon, who was still in power at the time, and I mentioned the Latin American tour and the crises that he promoted down there, the U-2 flight, the, uh, downing the peace conferences with Lee Harvey Oswald and Gary Powers in the Soviet Union, playing a part to break up the peace conference that Richard Nixon didn't want, but which President Eisenhower wanted, but his Fink vice president, of course, didn't want, and the Bay of Pigs operation that Richard Nixon headed and then the assassination of John Kennedy, mentioning last week how Nixon was in Dallas at the home of Clint Merchants and the close friend of Irv Davidson of Abscam fame. And then I mentioned in August of 1973 that Richard Nixon and his team planned to assassinate the president of Panama in 1971. Mr. Hunt and Liddy, working in the White House, used Operation Intercept, that was the Drug Enforcement Agency, as their cover. The president of Panama was not cooperating in the control of narcotics, and one of their jobs was to kill him. I published that in The Realist in 1973, and now Jack Anderson is coming in 1980, April 4th, 1987 years later, finding a long-buried document on not only the plans to kill the president of Panama, Carrillo's, but uh, to control the assassination teams 
not only in the CIA, but in the Drug Enforcement Agency and the use of people from those assassination teams to kill one of their important investigators, mentioning by name and also linking to Atlantic City and the casinos in Atlantic City, the killer team moving in organized crime, the CIA and the Justice Department, working in Vegas, in the Bahamas, and in Atlantic City. Now, the country, because it can't stand so many bank robberies, extortion, stolen paintings, and all the various crimes of blackmailing, eventually, if they try to solve any of these huge white-collar crimes, they're going to get to the assassination teams. But Torrio's name came out in the news last week, and that's why it was safe to let the Shah in the hands of the president of Panama uh, he had to flee at, at that particular date because a report was coming from Iran, 600-page report to be presented on the crimes of the Shah. But Torrijos delivers, and now we have Mr. Sadat holding his Shahness so that he can't write checks and bankrupt, uh, pull the money out. He is a prisoner, but Torrijos is a very important person because of the control that the United States have. They can either order him to obey or they can kill him, and uh, they've allowed him to rule there because they can control him so well. Besides that, Panama is the location of the police station of training American police. They can't be trained domestically by the Central Intelligence Agency, and according to Fletcher Prouty, who wrote me a letter on this matter, they're sent to the police academies from Los Angeles, San Francisco, Fresno, uh, your police departments, Minneapolis, wherever they are, the policemen can be sent to Panama for police training work, and that's where they learn the torture and the Nazi techniques. That's why there's so many death squads in police departments around the country, so many witnesses being shot, so many people being tortured. And even in Detroit, they've been branding people with hot irons. And uh, police abuse and police torture is in the news every single day. I'll give you a little homework project. Whatever city you live in, wherever you are, uh, cut out every murder, car crash of a young person, a political activist, an organized crime member, an Italian politician. Save those, and maybe once a month, the first of the month or so, send me a pack of death, musicians, writers, and so forth, and let me assimilate them with my material and see if they are coming together and are important to the sum of the work I'm doing. One of the very fine researchers, he's fairly new at it, but he's caught on very quickly, lives up in the Bay Area near here, near Palo Alto. Saw an article in the San Francisco Chronicle that was not in my version of the San Francisco Chronicle. We get a later date down on the peninsula. It's dated the same, but doesn't read the same. And uh, it has to do with a man named Frederick Schwend. And it was a short article. It just said, Lima, Peru. Former Nazi major Frederick Schwend, 80 years old, who printed counterfeit pounds and dollars in a bid to ruin the economy of Britain and the United States, died last week, the news report said. The Lima newspapers said that Schwend had been sentenced to death in absentia in Italy for war crimes, and they recalled he took part in the Nazi operation, and then there's this disclaimer, not carried out, aimed at des destabilizing the United States and British economy and flood Europe with fake dollars and pounds in the early 40s. Of course, I have an entire book on that called Bernhard, and there is a lot of documentation that they did use this money to flood the markets and to resurge the Nazis and take counterfeit money and put it in Swiss banks in the savings accounts of Avita Perón. I've mentioned four of those. But Schwind is a very important person, and I don't know if any of you picked this up in any of your local newspapers. I always say that the Washington Post and the New York Times are great at obituaries, but would you believe that uh, this death was April, March 30th, I'm sorry, of this year, and there hasn't been a single mention of it in any of the newspapers around except this little itty-bitty corner. I got out uh, one book, uh, so many books on Nazis, just for a view of this character, Mr. Frederick Schwinn, who passed away and uh, in aftermath, Farrago, Laszlo Farrago describes Mr. Schwind, and I think it's a good book, and I'll just give you a few quotes. He talks about Heinrich Mueller, the highest-ranking Nazi to leave Rome when the war was over, and how he stayed in a monastery in northern Italy, just as did Martin Bormann. He got his passport from what was the International Red Cross to let him leave. 
Of course, last week I mentioned the Red Cross uh, signs on an airplane that flew out 142 people from Nicaragua when uh, Somoza was kicked out. Uh, Mr. Mueller entered, entered an Argentine ship. He got to South America in 1950 wearing the garb of the Vatican, again, the priestly garb that Nazis wore to, to be sent all over the world, and he used the name Hans Rosa. He became an insurance salesman down in South America. And along with him came these other Nazis, and the secretary of the Vatican, Montini, who became Pope Paul VI, was writing passports for these Nazis. And among them, living down there in South America with Martin Borman and Mr. Rudell in Chile and Mr. Scorzeni and Mengele was Schwen, this Frederick Schwen. And he describes how Schwen went to Lima, Peru, and his friend Klaus Barbie, who took the name Altman, went to La Paz. And before long, they were front for drug pushing and gun running. Now, I've mentioned from many sources of books the Nazi uh, resurgence by using money from South America, narcotics, and gun running. They, we send guns down to them, and then the ships come back with narcotics, and we send more guns down and supply them just like American printers. In two states, the United States are shipping literature to Germany about Nazism. It can't be printed there. And so behind um, the facade of ships going back and forth for other purposes, uh, the guns go down and the dope comes back, and it funds recycles itself, and millions of dollars went into this operation. Now, it's an interesting thing. Uh, Laszlo Fargo writes about a man named Mr. Rossi, an important man down in Lima, Peru, rancher, Louis Ranchero Rossi, and uh, he was part of this uh, shipping tycoon industry of shipments going back and forth a very wealthy man, and he died quickly or mysteriously in the hands of Freddie Schwinn and Klaus Barbie Altman, two Nazis. And uh, Mr. Farrago wrote or believed that uh, their funding and operation for gun running and narcotics escalated when Mr. Rossi died. That reminds me of a man by the same name, a Mr. R-O-S-S-I, who ran a restaurant in the mercantile business uh, in Mercantile Bank where H.L. Hunt has his uh, offices in Texas, not the Mercantile Business, the Mercantile Bank. And Mr. Rossi ran restaurants there and Jack Ruby frequented it. And Jack Ruby asked Rossi if he wanted to be a business partner. He was going to come into a lot of money. This was Wednesday that Jack Ruby was in the offices of H.L. Hunt with a woman named Connie Trammell who had links to the Republic National Bank, identified in 1967 as black money, as CIA espionage money for assassination. Connie Trammell worked with men from Germany that came over uh, from Young Americans for Freedom that worked with General Walker, H.L. Hunt, and he took Connie Trammell to Mr. Hunt's office the Wednesday before John Kennedy was assassinated. And when he came down, Rossi talked to Ruby, and Ruby said he was coming into a lot of money. When I look back and see uh, men like Rossi being murdered down in Lima, Peru, and being involved with organized crime and gun running and um, narcotics and Nazis and resurgence of Nazis, I wonder if Jack Ruby had any part of the operation with a Rossi who is related to this Rossi. These are things we'd have to have people out in the fields looking up. I only say it's a coincidence of names because Ruby wanted to be his partner and uh, Rossi was murdered so that Schwen and his buddy could continue the operations down in Lima, Peru. Uh, there's quite a bit of it in the book, Aftermath, about Freddie Schwen and his operations and how the hoax of Martin Borman's death, the story that was in many books that Martin Borman died, was completely planned by Schwen. According to Fargo, that was made up by Schwen, that he had something to do with disseminating the story, and then Martin Borman and Schwen and all of them ended up in South America, all of their buddies down there. Uh, interesting to look up his name in the index of various books on the Nazi role that he had in the operation called Bernhardt, because here is a very important man who died March 30th, and except for one listener who takes the tapes who lived, uh, lives up in Palo Alto, I would never have known that the man had deceased, and after I read this, then I began to look up references He's a very important man, of course, and interesting to the history of our times, because as I said at the beginning of this tape, the United States is a captured nation. We couldn't compete with the phony millions and billions of blackmailed money that was put aside and printed to be used 
a few years after the war, when the Cold War period came, to I have a book which goes into the Schwen operation called Operation Bernhardt by Anthony Peary. Uh, the front cover of the book alone says, the story behind the greatest forgery of all time, 100 million in counterfeit English notes. Of course, they duplicated American money and German money and uh, French money and Italian money. And when the war before the war was open, over, they were sampling it in banks to see if anybody could pick up the counterfeit money. This Bernhard operation involved even engravers that they took out of concentration camps to use to make this huge amount of wealth. This is why I say the United States as a nation cannot survive with the Central Intelligence Agency, the secrets, the blackmail, the organized crime, the uh, don't, not even to mention the pollution and mind control and medical experiments and the DNA and the gene banks and so forth, what they're doing to us physically. But economically, there's no way to uh, fight the way that money was produced and reproduced and financed and manipulated because the minute the intelligence community or the FBI or any honest investigator opens the door of these putrid activities, it all gushes out, and it is the cause of so much bankruptcy. I hear the experts talk on radio on Sunday and on the evening news and the analysts and the financiers and they talk about the economy and the inflation and they have different words, double digit the economy and, and they worry about the price of gold or silver but they never talk about what happened after World War II or the crimes, uh, the multi-billion dollar crimes that are taking place now, the swindles and crimes that are allowed to happen, and the insurance company has to cover those, and then uh, our insurance rates go up. The manipulation of the money market because of the combination of the intelligence community to the Nazi mentality has never been put on the table to be exposed to the damage it's done to our economy. The historians and economists try to treat these problems logically or reasonably just like doctors try to treat the problems of hiver activity of children. They don't go into the corporations that put the poison in the food to make them hyperactive. They come to the conclusion that red dye makes them hyperactive, but they don't know why it's put in there or why it's necessary. And the economists miss the point, the historians miss the point, that there was a purposeful intent to do to us what is happening and that the only solution comes in unwinding the cast of characters that made this happen and the people that put them in a power to allow it to happen. Incidentally, in the book Operation Bernhardt, if you look in the references to Schwen, there are about 150 pages in a 300-page book on Frederick Schwen, and yet, as I say, his name wasn't in any of the uh, uh, newspapers except one morning edition of the San Francisco Chronicle. There are many, many pages about Mr. Colton Bruner, the Nazi that was an intertel with J. Edgar Hoover and Adolf Hitler. There are pages about him and a Dr. Willie Holton and Bernard Kruger. But Schwen is the main man in this whole book, Bernhardt and the Counterfeiting of Money. And he's a war cram criminal that should have been investigated who died at the age of 80 and a Again, a thundering silence on any biography. And he died at a time when the mafia and gun running and organized crime was breaking. The Abscam story was breaking in March of 1930. Not that an 80-year-old can't die when he's 80, but J. Edgar Hoover was old. And again, he was poisoned. And one of the White House plumbers uh, admitted how they had poisoned J. Edgar Hoover. And that was just days before George Wallace was shot at the height of Watergate uh, escapades when assassinations were uh, prevalent and more murders were planned. It's very important to note that Mr. Schwinn has left this earth without hardly a person knowing it at a time when his connections to organized crime, the CIA, the international connections, the gun running, and the fascist regimes were breaking in the newspaper. He expired, and there wasn't a word about him in the major newspapers. If there was, correct me and send it to me because my editions didn't have a word. On Bernhardt and the operations uh, of counterfeiting the money, it tells how I went to South America. It said Schwen was very wealthy when he left Germany. 
this is when he sailed out in the ni- middle of 1945. He had 1,500,000 Swiss francs at the Vaudus branch in the Bank of Liechtenstein, a holding worth another million Swiss francs in Trieste property, a holding company of 350,000 marks in an Austrian import and export firm, 100,000 marks worth of securities, all earned from his work from as the sales director for Operation Bernhardt. And he left Europe and settled in South America by the middle of 1945 and went on down there, and he was extremely wealthy. This book goes on to say how he uh, settled in South America, slipped out of town, and it says by his going down there, we lost the last thread of the case. You better believe we did because there were a lot of people that were going to use that money later and didn't want to develop it or tell you where it was. According to this author, Schwen's departure robbed the Allied investigators of one great source of knowledge, and he departed. The Bernhardt prophets were never really exposed, and the author says we were deprived of this information. It is my charge and allegation that the Allied investigators encouraged him to take it, allowed him to take it. He left through the aid of the Vatican so that someday this money could come back and get the communists. And that's why we are in the mess we're in today. We're out of time as usual. This is May Brussel in Carmel, California. I'll be with you next week. You take care and save your articles of accidents, deaths, murders and uh, crimes. Even if you don't think they're important today, save them for a while and send them to me later so we can put the pieces together. In the meantime, you take care and I'll be back with you next week.